On the show today, I welcome Chris Phillips, all the way from the UK. He is the Managing Director of International Prepare and Protect Security Office. Chris has extensive policing experience, and this includes nine years as event commander for major sporting events and concerts at Twickenham Stadium and Wimbledon Tennis. He's a really experienced security coordinator, and in this role, he coordinated the counter-terrorist security visits to the UK from foreign governments and dignities. His specialization, however, has been in the strategic counter-terrorism advice and best practice. In seven years at the helm at the National Counterterrorism Security Office, he was responsible for training, accrediting, tasking, and coordinating over 250 counterterrorism security advisors across the UK. He developed national strategies and a number of significant work streams, and especially for the protection of crowded places where NAXA were acknowledged as world leaders. Some of the training and awareness programs he has instigated are well known worldwide. For example, Project Argus, Know Your Customer, Secure in the Knowledge, the RAP program, Counting the Cost and Vulnerability Self-Assessment Tool. He is one of the few people who can say they are a consultant, speaker, and recognized industry expert in MeanIt. His speaking typically includes 20 plus keynote speeches a year at major conferences in the UK and abroad, and he writes many articles for magazines and newspapers and frequently comments on Terrorism Matters on TV and radio. Chris and I met over in the UK when I was working for the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, um, which was part of MI5. And he has been a fantastic mentor and friend during that time. And so it's with much happiness that I welcome Chris to the Digital Culture Ideas Show. Chris, how are you? It's um, Gosh, it's 1st of December today, so Merry Christmas for a start. But I guess kind of interesting times over there in the UK for you, the, the pandemic's still going on and, you know, I've seen threat levels increase from substantial to severe and there's just quite a bit going on. So how are you? Well, I'm very well, thanks. Uh, like everyone else, is uh, this, this whole COVID thing has made a big difference to our lives. You know, the, the work that we were able to do, we're probably not able to do now. Bit like you, I give lectures uh, uh, a lot of the time in person in front of two or three hundred people. Sometimes none of that's going on. Uh, no. But course, the terrorism bit is uh, is still there and it's still happening. And you may have picked up in Europe some of the things that have taken place. Really, you know that that's not going to go away. And um, it's twelve months yesterday from the attack uh, on London Bridge. So again, terrorism comes up in the news, and it's uh, a big part of our uh, of what we're talking about. Absolutely. I guess terrorism doesn't care that there are pandemics going on and things things happening in the world. In fact, they probably use them to their advantage. So um, it's it's now your your journey into security. I did want to talk about that because it, it is um, security is in a different place in the UK compared to New Zealand. You know, we don't see as much of the terrorism pieces over here, or it looks quite different. But I'm keen to get a rundown in, on your journey into security. You know, what was your pathway to security and, and why was that something that you got into? Yeah, certainly. And uh, I, I came in through policing and uh, I was a police officer, lots of experience, 30 years of policing, actually. Uh, and, um, you know, I would say the first thing I'd say is policing is not necessarily the perfect route into, into the security world, but actually it is a route uh, and it's a route that I took. And so... My history really is in general policing in, in London, uh, then followed by more specialisms around looking after crowded places. So Wimbledon Tennis, I looked after that for five years as a head of policing there. Then I went on to Twickenham Stadium, and, and your listeners will probably know Twickenham Stadium. Uh, I looked after that for six years. Um, and, um, you know, we made immense changes over that time. But in that time, we also were confronted by a new form of terrorism. And um, during my days at Wimbledon, we, we faced the IRA. We were still having IRA threats to our, to our uh, tennis tournaments. By the time I got to Twickenham, it was much more about uh, uh, Al Qaeda, ISIS, uh, uh, and that type of terrorism. So, so that was um, that was all interesting going on in the background. And then, from the policing world in London and, and the UK, we realised we needed uh, police officers with some specialist knowledge uh, and that's where I got involved more detail in, in the more detailed 
counterterrorism world and, and looking after big events, uh, whether it's heads of state coming to the UK, whether it was major sporting events. Uh, that was part of my responsibility as a security coordinator. And then from there, I moved to um, meeting you at Thames House, uh, where I became head of the National Counterterrorism Security Office. And almost the day I, I moved into that post, it was literally two or three days later, we had the big uh, set of uh, attacks in London. And uh, I realised that there, no one was actually talking about um, looking after crowded places, and yet crowded places with the locations being attacked. So. I came up with some some ideas, some plans around what we could do to protect crowded places. And it really hadn't been talked about before that, but uh, the government at the time latched themselves onto it, the police latched themselves onto it, and we started doing a great deal of work of that and, and on that. And that's really, you know, where we met, um, you know, and and how you can protect the, the very places that, um, unfortunately, terrorists want to attack. Yeah, the, the crowded places part is, is really intriguing you know because your average punter just wouldn't think about sort of what goes into keeping those events safe you know you're there to you know have fun and you know attend the tennis or or you know a football game or whatever it is and it was an eye-opener for me in terms of the art form that was going on in and behind the scenes to make it all seem seamless and and, and safe for people to attend um, and not an easy thing to protect either no, and it's all—it's very, very difficult to protect. But time and time again, these are the types of uh, uh, um, places that are being attacked. And I think, you know, if if I take you back in time to when the IRA were trying to attack and and commit terrorist acts, they were really focused on military, police, uh, government. Uh, and and whilst they did, you know, if you let a bomb off in central Manchester, the likelihood is you're going to kill people. They they mm -hmm. gave because they didn't really want to kill lots of people because they saw that as uh, as not working towards their aim. They wanted to persuade people, to, us to get out of Ireland, if you like. But actually, as soon as you look at what Al-Qaeda and its associate groups were trying to achieve, they just wanted body bags and they wanted to kill lots of people. So, so suddenly the Twickenhams, the Wembleys, the Wimbledons of this world, the shopping centres, the stadiums, the religious sites, as you've seen in New Zealand, suddenly become focus of uh, attack and and most of these places had never considered themselves to be mm -hmm. liable for terrorist attacks so so we had to do a great deal of work and it was stopping vehicle bombs it was it was about the search regime and the great work that you did as well around security culture because at the end of the day that's that's the bit that works and if you get the culture right then you've got a fair chance of having a safe uh, business yeah, thank you. And actually, I want to talk to you about that um, because you made a, a real impression on me when I was, um, you know, working at CPNI and and we we're working closely together because security culture, even at that stage, was in its infancy. You know, we were just kind of learning about what does this mean? How do you measure it? How do you actually change the dial on security culture and change people's behaviour? Like it was a learning <laughs> moment for me as much as. Um, as much as it was, uh, you know, really kind of coming to grips with that expertise. And I remember you saying to me, because I was like, oh, I'm not sure I know enough yet. And I was, you know, trying to just learn more. And you're like, no, 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 you are the security culture expert. You need to just be it now. Um, and then it, and that kind of made me go, oh, okay, yeah. So so when, when do you, how do you think people can actually recognize that they are the expert in something and they should just own it? Because I think our listeners would find that really valuable. Yeah, well, let's just go back to your piece. You know, uh, who had heard of security culture really before your team actually started talking about it? So you were leading off. You were the bleeding edge. You were the, the people that were thinking about this. And the one thing that CPNI did and does very well is to really think through the security issues and how you can make yourself better. Now, if you are and you get a specialism like you did, then... You know, and there's a very few number of people that were could even talk about this at the time. Then, then you really need to make the most of that. And um, as security changes, so new new pieces of kit, new bits of work will come in. And if you get into that uh, front edge of it, and you and you really understand it, and are able to talk about it and develop product, then really you should do that because um, you know it does you. It, 
you know, being an expert is an easy term to throw about. But um, when you are dealing with something nine to five for a number of months, you do become an expert and, and you should realize that and go for it. And um, and there are work. And, and listen, some of the stuff that you were doing at, um, at Thames House and anyone might not know what that is, but uh, what you were doing there and what you did at the Olympics is still really valid. In fact, it's so valid. In fact, most companies aren't doing it properly even no. now. So no. there's still a load to be done. And, and what you'll find now is a lo loads and loads of security experts will have jumped in on your coattails and be doing some of this. But actually, you know, you, you've got the expertise. You, you've been in it a long time. You understand how it how it all evolved. And, and it's important that we get this message out because most businesses still aren't doing security culture well. Mm. Yeah, that that is true, actually, and that probably has been my experience. Um, there is so much that can be done to change the dial on security culture, yet we're still kind of doing things from 10 years ago <laughs> in some ways in terms of awareness and, and comms and things like that. Um, yeah, thank you, Hilary. So one of the little jobs that I do, and it's a great, it's probably my favourite of all the jobs, is uh, penetration testing. So we'll actually me and I'll take a few ladies with me or a, a gen young man or something and we'll go and walk into businesses and walk around and sit at office desks and take computers and put uh, listening devices under tables and people will just ignore us or let us through the door mm. now you know the one thing that I say at the end of this when I when I manage it I pretty much always succeed the one thing that we say at the end of this is you've got to improve your security culture you've got to be telling people about security and how important it is if you want them to do something about it and encourage them. Yeah. And actually coming to your, your business, um, so <laughs> what was it, Chris? All the same things that we were talking about uh, probably was like 10 years ago. I know, I know. And still lots more work to do. So your, your company, so International Prepare and Protect Security Office, um, it is fascinating, your your security business, compared to, I guess, what Cordia is dealing with back here in New Zealand, is because there is really a, such a range of security threats, from terrorism in particular, we've already spoken about that, which we you know we don't currently experience in New Zealand in the same way, I say in the same way because we still do get it, um, but could you tell everyone about what your company is about and what you do? Yeah, so really I replicated what I was doing on behalf of the UK government. Uh, into a private company and at that time we were looking after crowded places we were developing uh, protective security for stadiums shopping centers bars nightclubs um, hospitals and religious sites and I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute because after the Christchurch incident I, I actually developed something that that might be of uh, use uh, and and try to work out well how do we how do we persuade organizations that terrorism and serious and organized crime is a big problem mm. because they don't believe that it's a problem. They won't do anything about it. Uh, and of course, what you'll see is time and time again, company, you know, something bad happens and then the company says, well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, we didn't think it would happen to us. Well, you know, the, the idea of this is to get in front of that curve and to start thinking about what would happen, you know, how can we stop this from happening in the first place? Uh, so, you know, it goes right through from, as I say, um, persuading boards of actually sometimes governments i've been to uh, speak to governments but sometimes boards of companies that um you know you really should be doing a little bit more and these are the basic things that you should have in place um whether it's security culture whether it's protective security measures around the building uh or whether it's better cyber security on on your site so trying to persuade people that this is a, a bit of an issue for them uh, but I also do lots of other things, and um, I've written some books, I've, I've done some guides, security guides. And the thing that I was going to mention was um, I recognised that uh, religious sites were really being targeted, really being targeted. Uh, and um, religious sites often haven't got a great deal of money and don't think of security at all. Yes. But, but yet we can see that security does work. And, you know, I could give you lots of examples. Synagogues, uh, a synagogue recently was attacked. The doors were shut, they had locks on the doors, they had people watching, uh, and no one was killed inside the synagogue. And then you see what happened in New Zealand, then you see what happened in uh, Sri Lanka, churches wide open uh, and bombers just walk in with a bomb. So 
So trying to persuade them to do that. So I, I set up a little app, a free app, actually, completely free of charge, that, uh, that can just give them a bit of inclination to think about securing their church, synagogue, uh, or a mosque, or whatever else it is. So, so things like that uh, I'll do. But also, I also these days do a lot of TV and radio, and and spend probably probably five hundred, do probably five hundred interviews a year on the different aspects of terrorism, security, organised crime, which is a, another big topic. Yes, yeah, um, I have seen the app that you produced. It was really good, actually. Like just some really good you know, information around, you know, if this is the space and think about having these things in place and, and you know, how to mitigate some of the risks that, it, yeah, absolutely. Teachers have. Yeah, it's broken into two, Hilary. One is what can you do now to try and make your site more secure? And then actually, and, and quite important, most importantly, what do you do if the worst thing happens? And this is the other aspect of my work that I'm really taking on now a lot more is crisis management. Uh, yes. and, you know, as an example, if, uh, you know, if those four people uh, in uh, in the mosque had seen this person come in with machine guns and were able to lock the front door quickly and run to the back of the premises and out, they could have, you know, the, the, the situation could have been um, much less worse than it was. So, so there are simple things that people can do to respond to um, uh, something really bad happening. And I've wor I'm working with a couple of companies, one which has got a really good system, which, which allows people to communicate during a crisis. And, and these things, are, are, I think they're quite useful and I don't get paid for it. I just kind of help them to get into the market a little bit. Oh, that's fantastic. And actually, I want to come back to talking a little bit around the security threats that you're seeing, because... Um, you know, if so your business, it's been in business for, for 10 years now, and obviously you've got a, a history behind that in terms of the work that you did through through government as well. So what are you seeing in terms of security threats? You know, what's changed? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what's changed now. And, and you know, we, we talk about the last six, 10 to 10 months of this COVID. Mm. Uh, a massive change, and I don't think businesses have worked it out yet. The, the lone worker, uh, piece is a is a huge um, yeah, what well, is increased well it's just enormous yeah. pretty much everyone's working from home now and uh, if and if you're working from home that brings out a whole new set of security risks including um, you know people in in bad situations where they're working so they maybe have people that live with them that may be a, a, a concern a threat to them right through to the way they're sitting. I mean, as an example, it's not a security related thing, but I spoke to my cousin who's, um, whose friend is actually lives in a bed sit and has to work from her bed. Doesn't have a table, doesn't have a chair to sit on, sits on her bed uh, and she's only able to work from there. So, so you can imagine in, in due course, there's gonna be psychological issues with that. There's gonna be, um, there's gonna be back problems, all the things that go with that. But then I'm taking on top of that, people are in the future going to work from cafes, hotels, and then the whole thing about uh, logging on to Wi-Fi, people copying what you're talking about, losing your losing your uh, data, you lose people watching what you're doing, and, and all those things that, that go along with that, which you're uh, very much aware of. So, so there's a whole new issue, I think, that we need to think about. And the other thing I think we're going to see is offices that are now one floor is one company because the companies are all realizing they don't need to fill a whole office they're going to be yeah. more multi-tenanted so you've got businesses working alongside each other and then if you do get some kind of an incident or a crisis how they communicate with each other again it's a big issue that just hasn't been thought through mm, and because we've got these sort of hybrid workforces as well don't we with a bunch of people at home and a bunch of people at work but do you know where everyone is to know how to yeah. communicate with them? You know, them? Yeah. You, know, if, uh, you know, if there's an earthquake uh, or there's something major happens in an area, do you know even if you've got any people there? So, yes. And I don't even think companies do that. And, and they still have a duty of care. And I think, I think businesses need to reassess their duty of care now as to, as to you know, what they need to do, where they need to do it, and, and how are people going to communicate? I mean, as an example, something happens in the city centre and you don't want your staff to come to the office. Mm. Oh. Excuse me. 
Yes, that's true. Uh, one thing I worry about is a whole lot of a whole lot more data breaches yeah. uh, than we've ever had before because businesses did rush um, to get online and remote. They they did they're now running in cloud infrastructure which they haven't before. Um, and you know people and, and even just individuals like we became a lot more comfortable downloading heaps of apps and doing heaps of things online the the digital relationship we trust more now than we ever have before which opens us up more to scams and frauds and things like that so we're putting our passwords and usernames everywhere and i just know that there's so many people not using password managers and yeah there's just going to be a lot of people out there yeah using the same bit of kit for your children's st home study or the children are using it and then you're working on it as well you know how easy is that going to be to break into and and uh, i think you will have seen it as well you know these uh, these hacked wi-fi's where you literally you know you can close a wi-fi down for an area and then and then you get a, a, a little notification saying just flick here and you're back on the wi-fi and of course you're not you're on you're on yes. some wi-fi and if, if they know that you're an important person in the company they can take everything off your laptop or your, your um uh, ipad or whatever it is so so these issues, I don't think companies are thinking them through. And as you said, the hybrid, this hybrid model, well, that brings up a whole new set of problems that uh, really need to be considered. Mm. One thing that we're sort of hotly debating over here in New Zealand um, is around how much, and this is an interesting one for you and me, because we, we both do a bit of, um, I'm, I'm newer to the patch, but a bit of TV work, a bit of radio work. You know, how, how much should we, communicate with the media when security incidents are going on or even and post them. And the New Zealand government, um, particularly around the DDoS attacks, um, mm. distributed denial service attacks, has sort of come out saying, look, don't communicate with the media. It does give, you know, attackers a heads up in terms of the impact it's having on your business. Just don't say anything, don't say anything, which is, which I get, but it's also at odds with, sharing information and helping everyone be safe and and things like that i don't know is that is that something that you're you think yeah. about or have any view on it's, it's a tough you know, you know, this whole crisis management thing is a huge issue and um i i ran a crisis exercise the other day uh, uh, online a webinar um just talking through some of the issues of something happening in a city center and then what do people communicate? Have they got a means of communicating? Should you talk to the media? Have you got someone that can, would know how to write a media strategy or you know the communication messages that need to go out? Um, who's gonna take charge? Particularly if your CEO's in one side of the world and someone else is on, you know, and because you're all working from home. So, you know, this, um, this has got a, a lot of legs in it. And the whole point of crisis management, you know, some firms have got uh, media teams, um, PR teams or whatever, but most haven't. And and so, what message are you trying to put out? If if one of your people gets killed, as an, as as a, as a point, or your company gets hit, you know, what is the strategy? Have you got a plan? If you haven't got a plan, your plan will probably change when you start using mm -hmm. it. You've thought through um, what you might want to do. Yeah, that's right. Actually, that's quite true. With um with a more remote workforce when there's a crisis actually that's a different kettle of fish isn't it because it used to be that you could get all the exec in the room together and they would just huddle and think it through together but actually now it's coming into remote rooms <laughs> and, and it out yeah. that way and the fact that your system works at the time the one of the, the we've had some great lessons over here because so much happens in and around london and, and the uk we, you get some great failures which you can learn from and and one of the um one of the big failures uh, that, that that i had some dealings with uh was um you may remember this in oxford circus in central london there was basically a punch up on the platform uh, and because ollie mayers was nearby he tweeted out that there was a terrorist incident and i've just heard guns being fired which caused a mass panic and people were communicating, everyone was running away. And this was all down to a, effectively one or two tweets by a person that, that's got two million followers. So, mm. so the ongoing problem from that was how are people, what, what's going on? What do we do? Uh, and I, I got a couple of bits of work out of it, actually, because they were trying to communicate from WhatsApp, by WhatsApp. And 
if any of you, if I got one piece of advice, if any of you are using WhatsApp for your crisis um, management, it's not a good, it's not a good way of doing it. You've got too much flour in the way. You get too much information in the, the way it comes out on your messages is poor as well. Uh, so that you know they had, you know, as an example, one of the big hotels had ten thousand messages on their WhatsApp list because they had all their staff on it, and of course uh -huh. they phoning in what's going on what's happening i don't know what's happening i've just seen on the news there's a terrorist so no one could communicate and um do we close the doors and keep people in do we let people out and and these um these are real issues and and just to take that one as the example what do you do if there's a terrorist attack somewhere in the city center not necessarily at your building but somewhere in the city center do you lock people in the hat in the in the building to contain them to hold them in or do you let them out? Well, whatever you're going to do, you need to think it through because you can't just lock people in a building for a start. It's very difficult, particularly if everyone's got a different um, system, you know, a different plan. All the different companies in that office have got a different plan. We'll go and stand at that. We'll go and we'll go. We'll all go outside and stand in the fire area, you know, where we where we and then Kimberly, yeah, and then the terrorist comes down and shoots everyone or leaves a bomb there. So. So you you need to think through this stuff and and practice it um, and you know to come back to that one. If your only plan is to evacuate your building, then that's not going to work. No, that's true. Gosh, that's fascinating, actually. And and yeah, you're right. So much of news is reported through what's come up on Twitter. <laughs> you know, like literally, reporters will cut out pictures from Twitter and say, "This has just happened." Da 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 da. It because be it's on Twitter, got to be real. Yeah, and actually, so, yeah. companies monitoring Twitter. I'm sure this is nothing new, but actually monitoring what's been said on Twitter about you is quite quite key. <laughs> Absolutely, my goodness. And and what observations do you have around sort of you know we've we've mentioned sort of exec teams and boards, but you know are, are they handling security as a business risk from from what you're seeing over in the UK? No, definitely not. And it's not just the UK. I was over in Melbourne. Uh, I did a talk um, for all the stadium people who, that manage stadiums across Australia, mainly Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but it was clear to me that really terrorism, major crime, organised crime is not part of their. And in fact, um, in fact, they don't like to think of it because they think, well, it's never likely to happen to me. But of course, it will happen to someone. Uh, and it's very interesting what's happening now. You may not have picked this up. You'll remember a couple of years ago we had the attack in Manchester with all the young children were killed mm. um, you know they're, they're actually going to change the law now to make it legislative that you do consider and do things around terrorism counter-terrorism as part of your package right. um so there's an awful lot to do because whilst my team have been talking about this and you know at natso and all the ctsas have been talking about this for nearly 20 years now the you know companies Close their eyes, they close their eyes, and and what they'll say is, yeah, but how likely is it that this will happen? Mm. In fact, it's devastating if it does. I mean, if mm. you look, you know, from your from the cyber side, if you look at what happened, uh, was it to Walmart or no, um, the the big store in the US, I forget what it's called now, but basically they they got attacked, cyber attack through through their distributor, and all the senior senior board was sacked as a result of the target. That's the company target. Yes, All yeah. were, were sacked because of it. So, you know, unless they're seeing these risks and really feeling that they might happen, they could happen, then they're trying to save money. And mm. security is always viewed, whatever type of security is always viewed as, you know, uh, there's no bonus to it. It was just money wasted. We could use it on making money. But actually, of course, if you have a security breach of any kind, physical, cyber uh, or a person attack then then actually your company could be finished yes that's right yeah massive um could be extinction extinction events for for organizations um so that's interesting so did you say the uk is about to make legislative changes that companies have to think about terrorism or is it schools what was no, the this is uh stadium so anyone that's uh doing an event so that happened at the manchester arena uh, I didn't know the 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 guy was basically walked in as everyone was starting to leave, uh, and he detonated a bomb, killing lots of 
children. And, um, you know, the the security company have been found wanting from what they did. The um, the managers of the event have been found wanting. And they're, and they're all, you know, up in front of the inquiry at the moment. And they're absolutely embarrassed mm. you, by their mm. lack of forethought that, that anyone could attack a, a stadium, a, a, an event like that. But we've known that for 20 years. You yeah. Know? And, and I always, I always say to companies when I do a talk, is okay. You're making some decisions here. Will you imagine standing up in front of a court and, and explaining why you've made that decision to save some money? You didn't do the security right, or you didn't spend the, you didn't patch a network uh, appropriately. Uh, you know, you, you stand in front of a, or you know, whether it's, um, whether it's a court of law, or whether it's, um, you know, the, the media, and try to explain to them why you didn't do it. And you'll find it very difficult. Mm, absolutely. When I started this digital culture podcast, um, I have to admit, like I was on a, a learning journey. Like I, I wanted to inter interview people that I found really interesting and who inspired me, and and just kind of chat together about the impact that technology is having on people and how we think and behave and communicate and, and interact. And I've and I've, if I've as I've gone through this digital culture kind of experience versus a security culture experience, I've drawn lots of parallels between the two because it's all culture change at the end of the day. Um, and, and part of it with security culture was trying to, you know, upskill people in terms of their capability and improve their behaviours. And in digital culture, it's kind of the same. It's about, you know, getting people to be more um, tech savvy and comfortable with technology and, and kind of embracing these new ways that we can kind of operate. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about how business and life is going digital? And, you know, security obviously needs to be included in that. Yeah, well, the, you know, the whole thing is a big mix together, isn't it? It's, uh, the holistic security model says that you must have good physical security. You need to have some doors to stop people coming in. Uh, you need to have good cyber security, information security, because if you don't do that, uh, then, you know, people will just uh, get, get in through that system. Uh, but the key one actually is about people and, and people override everything. They, they're a company's strongest uh, part of the organization. They're the thing that probably makes you the most money, but they're already the biggest, already the biggest, weakest part of your organization as well. And often that's through not really understanding what they should do or why they're doing something. They don't understand why they need to not use a particular system while they're using their, their, their work. So they don't. If they don't understand, then they just won't do it. And and there are going to be those people that accidentally leak everything that you've ever got. And there's those people that deliberately do so. Mm -hmm. And you it's not about the people who deliberately do so because you can you can be focusing in on making sure you employ the right people. But you need you do need to be constantly letting people know that that security is important, that that the actions that you take could decimate the company and everyone's jobs with it. Uh, and and uh, they play a key part in the organizational security. And, you know, going back to my penetration test, I can always get through the external security border. So if you're thinking that your security guard from a computer system, if you're thinking that your, um, uh, your you know, your system that you bought is you can't get penetrated because it's got too hard. Well, you can always get through that. But it's the actions of the people that are inside that make a difference. I, I've been inside, I've been working around banks, and someone's come up to me and said, can I help you? I don't recognise you, and, and wouldn't accept my my word. Took me to security, and I said, that's fine. You caught me well done. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, um, digital stuff, isn't it? It's, um, you know, you, you can't rely on someone else to, to secure your company. You can't rely on your security guards because they can be got around. You've got to, everyone's mm. got to play their part in keeping a, a business secure. That's very true. I often talk about a kind of a triangle with that. So, you know, people need to have some kind of trigger that they need to do some kind of behaviour. So that might be an alert or alarm or whatever it is. Um, but then they also need to be motivated. So that's knowing the consequences, knowing the impacts, um, you know, that part. Then the last part is actually having the capability. So have they been trained as well? And often if you're struggling with different areas of your business, you need to think about well, which part of the triangle isn't mm. isn't working. And then that kind of helps you, you know, work out how to help them as well. 
got to take it seriously, you know, and you talk about the C-suite, you know, if they don't take security seriously, if they don't, you know, if, if a whistleblower comes and tells them about something that's going on, then they've got to deal with it and deal with it seriously. And, um, you know, far too often we find that the CEOs and senior people in an organisation don't feel that security is for them. They don't need to wear the badge. Everyone knows what they look like. They're, so, you know, it all flows down from the top, really. And if you don't get the top right, then the bottom certainly won't uh, operate uh, effectively either. Yes, we, we take a lot of our behavioural cues from our leaders, don't we? The leaders have to go first. They yeah. must go first. So so what's next for you or what's next for, you know, your organisation, International Prepare and Detect Security Office? You know, what are you looking forward to? What's coming up? Well, I think um, I'm moving uh, moving much more into the crisis management side because that seems, seems to me to be a huge gap. Um, people aren't doing crisis well. Uh, and, you know, if ever there was a crisis that could have been foreseen, but probably most governments had a look at it and then didn't fancy it, it was the COVID. You know, on every on every government's register, there must have been this possibility. But how many were actually prepared for it? How many companies actually had that kind of thing in their, in their uh, crisis management, you know, thoughts that had ever done any preparation for not being able to get access to your office? And how do you communicate with people when they're not in the office? And how does the business function without this? So, so I think crisis management is an interesting side to it and crisis communications particularly. But I'll keep going on doing what I'm doing. Um, I've probably got another 10 years of uh, trundling along doing this stuff. Um, I do enjoy the TV and the radio stuff because it's um, because it's always what's happening now. The trouble is, of course, you know, you're, you're down to what happens. And I just unfortunately think that terrorism is going to grow over the next couple of years. I think I, I said at the very start of this lockdown that before the end of the lockdown, we will have a lot of violence on the streets. Completely correct. Caused by, you know, in the UK, I don't know if you had any in, in New Zealand, but we had riots over here caused by someone being killed in another country on another continent. And it was it's just crazy. Uh, but people were frustrated. And I think the next six months are going to be really interesting as to what happens on the security side. And and the one thing I would say to you and, and people that are watching this, just really look out for the serious and organised crime groups because mm. they're, they're a worldwide phenomenon. And their their businesses, just like yours are, they, they actually have very rich people funding them. They've got lots of resources. And whether they attack you through your digital methods or through your physical methods, there's a lot of them out there. And um, what we've seen with the countries all free and up, some of the companies with lots of organised crime, we've seen it spreading and it's going to continue to spread. Mm. Yeah. And, and if people want to find out more about you, Chris, where's the best place to go? Well, you can go to my website, uh, ipso.co.uk. A, a number of your people, well, certainly a number of people in New Zealand will have done my training course. Uh, I, I, I video filmed a training course of, around counterterrorism, around and, it, and it's basically a terrorism awareness course. It's about how you travel safely, how you operate your business safely. Um, that's available if, if people want to do it. Uh, I think about 400 people in New Zealand did it in the end. Um, yeah, so it's uh, so there's lots of things out there, and uh, I'm quite happy to come over to New Zealand. Love to come over to New Zealand, particularly in the, yeah. when the Lions are playing. Uh, but um, no, it's uh, you know training awareness. Uh, I think I'll carry on doing that. And um, ipso.co.uk is the place to have a look at my website, and I'll be on there. And um, if anyone wants to contact me, then I'm sure Hillary will um, will give you my details. Yeah, absolutely. They'll uh, we'll have them in the um, in the show notes and. I must say, your I did see your crisis simulation that you I haven't seen it, sorry, but I did see it come up. Is that yeah. something you're going to be rerunning as well? Because that's very current for for lots yeah. of organisations. Yeah, and, well, and any kind of time zone that might be good for New Zealand. Well, <laughs> I suppose. Um, I, I, I company that did it. I didn't do it myself. I, I was part of the. I think the company who did it would be quite prepared to do that if there was enough take up in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and that was really around a, a terrorism attack, a terrorist attack. And we talked about a lot of things we mentioned today around, do you lock down? How do you lock down? Are you going to let some people out, but not others? What happens if you let the terrorists in? And all the kind of stuff that goes with that. So it was a 
quite an interesting hour's discussion. And uh, if, if that's something that fits, and then I'll get it organized for yourselves over there. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you, Chris. It's been wonderful having you on the show and, and seeing you again. I really appreciate all your time and your, um, you know, your really awesome comments and, and guidance for people as well. So thank you so much. You're welcome, Hilary. Best wishes uh, to you and uh, all, all the people in New Zealand. Uh, you do a great job and, uh, you know, we, it was, you were a great loss to us actually over here. So uh, lucky old New Zealand getting you back. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, take care. Okay, bye. Okay, everyone, that's it. Episode over. Please subscribe and leave a review. It would mean the world to me.